Welcome, everyone, to this special episode of our Peace On podcast, which is sponsored by the Peace Alliance. I am Matthew Albrecht, a board member and former longtime staff director of the Peace Alliance. And today we're pleased to be sharing um, a conversation that I'll be having with Sam Daly Harris, who's a very good friend of ours and a very powerful trailblazer and advocate for social change and citizen engagement. Uh, we're very excited and honored to be having this conversation today, in which we'll talk about Sam's newly rewritten 2024 edition of his book, Reclaiming Our Democracy, Every Citizen's Guide to Transformational Advocacy. Uh, so I'll get started today by introducing you all to Sam and then moving into some questions. Uh, so Sam Daly Harris started with a career in music, but then went on in 1980 to found the highly respected and successful anti-poverty lobby organization, Results. He also co-founded the Microcredit Summit campaign in 1995 with Nobel Peace Prize laureate Muhammad Yunus and Finca founder John Hatch. And then in 2012, he founded Civic Courage, which he's currently working with. Um, the aforementioned 2024 edition of Sam's book, Reclaiming Our Democracy, was named an editor's pick by Publishers Weekly's Book Life, and Kirkus Reviews called it a handbook for aspiring activists that readers will find to be both inspiring and practical. In 2010, Ashoka founder Bill Drayton wrote, that Sam Daly Harris is one of the certified great social entrepreneurs of the last decades. And I know firsthand how powerful the work is that Sam has done. At the Peace Alliance, uh, we worked with him directly for a few years. And even from our very founding before uh, working directly with Sam, he had his DNA all over our work. As Lynn McMullen, one of the people who helped launch the Peace Alliance, worked closely with Sam uh, for many years on results. Uh, and then she led our grassroots efforts very much in the model of how Sam and results work. And uh, he'll be sharing much of how that model works in greater detail today. So it's a nice full circle moment to get to loop back in with you, with uh, Sam on this forum. And it really was such a pleasure having this conversation. Sam is such a wise person and uh, has had his hands on so much great social change work over the decades. So I think you're really going to enjoy what we talked about. Um, I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, it's newly rewritten uh, almost completely, he shared with me. And I read the original, which was a really important, profound book. And I've been reading the new edition. And there's just so much in it to be inspired by. And I hope everyone will uh, check it out. So I want to just start this conversation with a question uh, about the big why that this book is answering. One of the big topics that um, I see and hear from so many frustrated people who are often essentially enraged or at the very least overwhelmed by the state of politics and our elected officials and feeling very deflated by the toxic political discourse. And for a lot of us, the political class too often seem like their alignment could be more focused on where the money is for their campaigns rather than what deeply matters. And yet we are also as citizens and voters of a representative democracy, far too often abdicating, abdicating our responsibilities to influence them. Uh, we, we think we can just vote every once in a while, maybe make a donation to a nonprofit or a candidate and that's maybe the best we can do, but it's really not. And this is where your book really takes off, uh, that we're responsible for helping to direct public policy through our elected officials at all levels of government, uh, working to help them stay on a righteous path and working to support things that matter to all of us. And um, related to that's an important quote from your new book, which um, you share in which you share that this book is focused on a broken citizenry, on our reluctance and seeming inability to engage in fixing those problems. The book is focused on repairing our civic paralysis and on delivering transformational advocacy. I love that, that word, transformational advocacy. So can you share more with us what you mean by fixing our broken citizenry, uh, citizenry? And, and then tell us how you got into this work? 
Okay, great. Well, there's a lot there. Um, let me just say, um, I, I'm going to tell a quick story. Uh, I was at a forum, a democracy forum, last weekend at my local library. And there was, there. Uh, I live in Princeton, New Jersey, and there were Princeton professors and the like. Uh, and the keynote speaker, I asked this question. And the question was, um, I'm going to ask my question three ways in 20 seconds. And the question was, given your analysis, what can ordinary people do? Or said another way, what can we do? Or have you seen something around the country where you've gone, oh, yes, that's what's needed. That's what. And, you know, it's a tough question because most people provide nuanced uh, conversations and analyses of our predicament, but n n not much about what ordinary citizens can right. do. And so this is where this book is like it flips all of that and is really focused on the difference that citizens can make. And so I'm going to uh, tell my story of self. This whole concept it's uh, was developed by Marshall Gans, a professor at Harvard. Um, he actually worked with Cesar Chavez in the 70s for a decade. And basically, the story of self is what happened in your life and what decisions did you make that got you to this commitment? Or mm -hmm. said another way, why do you do what you do? Mm -hmm. And I make a big point in the book that it's important for us, volunteers or staff in organizations, to know our why and share it. That that foundation is so important for us to know and hear and share with others. So. Here's my story of self and um, it's kind of what happened in my life and what decisions did I make that got me to this commitment. I have a bachelor's degree and a master. I tell this all the time. <laughs> we have it's like a, a central. I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in music. And I played percussion instruments in the Miami Philharmonic Orchestra for 12 years and taught high school music. And 43 years ago, I founded the anti-poverty lobby results. And a lot of times I'm asked music, poverty lobby, what's the connection? And when I look back in my life, there's certain experiences that start shifting my focus to a different direction. I graduated from high school in 1964 and played timpani in the orchestra at the graduation ceremony. And just before the ceremony started, a flute player came back to the percussion section and told me that a high school fraternity brother of mine, a year younger, had died the day before in a tractor trailer accident in Georgia. It was her next door neighbor, so she knew about it before I did. I always say, I was 17. Mm. When I was 17, mortality was an irrelevant concept. But during the funeral and the mourning period, I went with my friend's younger brother to pick up his report card from the homeroom teacher. I mean, imagine going into, it was my algebra teacher, going into a friend's homeroom teacher who had just died to pick up their report card. And it began to dawn on me that maybe I had 17 more minutes or months or years. And the questions of purpose came up. Why am I here? What am I here to do? What's my purpose? Four years later, 1968, college graduation, U.S. Senator Robert Kennedy is assassinated right around those days of graduation. It's another, what is this life? What is this death? Why am I here? What am I here to, no answers, but that question is getting really clear. Nine years later, I'm now to 1977, I'm invited to a presentation on ending world hunger put on by the Hunger Project. And I go to this thing thinking, well, hunger is inevitable. What do I know? I'm a musician. I mean, it's inevitable in my mind because there are no solutions. Again, what do I know? Because I'm thinking if there were solutions, somebody would have done something by now. But I go to this thing and it's obvious right away 
there's no mystery to growing food, clean water, basic health, literacy. I'm not hopeless about the perceived lack of solutions. I'm hopeless about human nature. People will just never get around to doing the things that can be done. But there's one human nature I have some control over, my own, and my question, why am I here? What am I here to do? So I get involved in a big way. This is the end of the story. In 1978 and 1979, I spoke to 7,000 high school students, classroom by classroom, on ending world hunger. And before I went into the first classroom, I read some statements from Jimmy Carter's Commission on World Hunger and others calling for the political will to end hunger. So I asked 7,000 high school students What's the name of your member of Congress? I don't want to know if you wrote them. I don't want to know if you met them. Just their name. Out of 7,000 asked, 200, fewer than 3% could answer correctly. 6,800, over 97% couldn't tell me the name of their member of Congress. And results grew out of this gap between the calls for the political will to end hunger on the one hand and the lack of basic information on who represented us in Washington on the other. We didn't then work with students. I mean, I actually did this initial work with adults, but I learned the lesson by asking these 7,000 students what the name of their member of Congress was. So, you know, knowing your why, why does this matter to you? Why does it matter to me? And sharing it, you know, is critically important. Barry, thank you for sharing that. That's a, a powerful story that I think a lot of people can relate to in terms of we, we all have experiences in life that bring uh, hopefully us empathy and passion. And I think a lot of folks don't, they really don't believe they, we have the power to, to, make things shift. And that's what I loved about that phrase, transformational advocacy. You talk about in the book, transactional advocacy and the difference between that and transformational. I wonder if you could share a little on that. Yeah, and let me tell you where I got it or said another way, we were doing it for decades. Mm -hmm. I just never named it. <laughs> and the naming was inspired by, there's a professor now at Johns Hopkins, uh, Hari Han, and, uh, and in one of her books, she calls it transactional mobilizing and transformational organizing. I'll explain it in, in a moment. But essentially, she's focused a little more on what the staff does. The staff is mobilizing transactionally or transformationally organizing. I call it transactional um, advocacy to focus more on what the volunteer does. And the, the distinction is this, transactional advocacy is, for example, sign the petition, mm -hmm. transaction complete. Transformational advocacy is less known uh, and more powerful. It's when volunteers are trained, encouraged, and then succeed at doing things as advocates that they never thought they could do. And as a result, they see themselves in a new light. They see themselves as community leaders. There's a transformation in who I see myself to be. So I, I didn't sign that petition and okay, that's done, it's good, but I didn't change. No, no, no. When my first letter to the editor is published in the paper, I'm changed in a way. I see myself in a new way. When I go through the knees knocking together that first meeting with a member of Congress and I'm going to get it wrong or am I going to get it right? And I, and I do it and I frankly do a pretty good job. That's the transformation, the seeing myself in a new light and, and kind of being changed by my advocacy. Uh you know, I, I just want to give people like a granular sense of what that can look like, because you'll, you'll talk about a lot of successes. But when we worked with the Peace Alliance, again, using the kind of the model that, that you all worked with, this tr it really is transformational advocacy 
and then directly with you on some of these things. So I just want to go over for people some of the things that we directly accomplished at the Peace Alliance uh, doing this. And because I think what you're saying is um, so important. So many people, it's just, it goes over their head that they have any sway beyond, again, just kind of voting or maybe making a donation, which are, they're not unimportant things. I don't, don't no. mean to minimize those things, but they're kind of, for me, uh, just the basic steps that everybody should take. Um, and beyond that, there's all kinds of things people can do. But so at the Peace Alliance, I just want to talk about at the policy level, some of the things that our, so we organized grassroots teams. We had hundreds of teams around the country organized by congressional district early on. And then at other times things shifted, but, but that this was at our peak. And we would go meet with these members of Congress and have these powerful conversations with them and and just directly sway them, which, you know, most of their lobby visits, which I think I learned this from you, are uh, corporate lobbyists, people that are paid lobbyists that go and meet with these elected officials and push them to get behind things. So the idea that citizens go is unfortunately rare, but uh, can be even more powerful because they know who votes for them ultimately. And they know who lives in their communities, the people that live in their communities go to vote for them. So, so here's some of the things that we accomplished under this model. Uh, we helped secure over $110 million in funding for international peace building priorities. We led successful, a uh, successful national effort to secure the U.S. Institute of Peace, which already exists. They were going to delete their funding completely, uh, and we helped keep them uh, rolling and going. Uh, this is something we did directly with you, Sam, when you were coaching us. We passed meaningful uh, provisions of the Youth Promise Act, which is one of our top legislative priorities. It went in as part of the final version of what was called the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, which passed into law, and the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency, Juvenile Justice, Delinquency and Prevention Act. And that put a tremendous amount of money and infrastructure into supporting young people who are at risk for violence and just getting on, on the wrong track in life. Um, we supported the path for President Obama to sign an executive order to institutionalize the U.S. State Department's Atrocities Prevention Board. Um, we, uh, one of our initial kickoffs was the U.S. Uh, legislation for U.S. Department of Peace, now called Department of Peacebuilding, and we garnered over 70, I think over 90 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives for the legislation, and we found somebody to lead it in the Senate. And while that ultimately didn't pass, it educated a lot of elected officials on what is peace building, and it helped, you know, pave the way for some of these other successes. So those are just a few things directly from, you know, people who are listening to this might be more familiar with our network, but these are like things that actually happen from doing this kind of activism. And so, you know, just want to give people something granular and a thank you for, for helping to helping train our system to do this work. Yeah, brilliant. And with something I like to say is members of Congress know everything we've ever asked them to know, which isn't very much. And so when we lift up some of these programs and uh, that you've mentioned, probably hearing it from us for the first time and from no one else much, sad to say. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah the, the spokespersons are needed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, on, on that topic, you, you mentioned media. Um, let's talk a little about media and the work you do with it. There, there were two stories um, on 60 Minutes in 2023. One of uh, them was on the vanishing wild and another on removing carbon from the atmosphere, in which the hosts essentially said, you know, there's no political will to do any of the things that you're recommending. And in both episodes, uh, there was hopelessness around creating you know, political will in quotation marks. And as you've shared, you know, as you founded the anti-poverty lobby results in 1980, uh, with the goal of creating the political will to end hunger and, you know, the worst aspects of poverty, what kind of progress can, other progress can you point to in creating political will that you've seen yeah. over your work over the years? Yeah, yeah. okay, this is, this is great. This, so I'm gonna give, a, 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 I'll call it a success but it's so unknown. It's as if it never really quite happened, except for that it did. Mm. When results started lobbying in 1984, and we're nearly 40 years ago, and you know, so and we've lobbied every year for 40 years on this and other things. 
UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund, was reporting that 40,000 children around the world under five were dying every day from largely preventable things, things like measles coupled with malnutrition or dehydration brought on by drinking dirty water or, or, and the like. Results volunteers lobbied every year, 85, 86, 97, 90, 2001, two, every year. And the, the latest report from UNICEF is that the 40,000 child deaths a day has fallen to 13,800. It's nearly a 66, 66 mm. percent decline in global child deaths. And uh, back in 1986, results volunteers generated 90 editorials around the country, not letters to the editor, but where they enrolled the newspaper editorial writer and board to write an editorial from the newspaper on tripling the child survival fund back then. And the head of UNICEF, Jim Grant, he, we would send these editorials out four at a time, five at a time to all kinds of pe people that needed to see them. In our last batch, he a handwritten note on my cover letter, he wrote, I thank you in my mind at least weekly, mm. if not more often, for what you and your colleagues are accomplishing. But I thought I should do it at least once this year in writing. Mm. And then 27 years later, uh, former UNICEF Deputy Executive Director Kool Gautam was quoted in the New York Times in an interview of saying essentially that the same thing. It was because of the receptivity created by results that child survival funding increased so dramatically, and that led many other countries to come on board. And so that particularly was 1986 to 2013, those two examples of the compliments. But it's it's sadly a little known, you know, if, if I go out on the street and I say, well, how's the world doing these days? I'll get something related to hell in a handbasket or something with little recognition of progress on much of anything. And that's sad because, yeah, we've got problems that we need to deal with. But it's not like we've never uh, succeeded in in uh, dealing with issues that we need to address. Yeah, it's important. And that's such a powerful testament, too, just to have such heavy hitters really get the power of having the support of people yeah. on the ground behind yeah. the cause. I mean, yeah. it's, it's critical. Can I give you one more example that's newly in the book? In 2019, uh, President Trump called for a 29% cut to the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. It was up for a three-year replenishment. The Global Fund and its partners had saved 38 million lives since its inception in 2002 to 2019. And the president called for a 29% cut. Most people would go, well, what can you do? I mean, that's, can't fight City Hall. Mm -hmm. No, 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 activists rolled up their sleeves and they got hundreds of members of Congress to sign letters, Republicans and Democrats to the appropriating committees, uh, chairs, to uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. They got hundreds of members of Congress, House and Senate, Republicans, Democrats, to co-sponsor resolutions supporting the Global Fund. And at the end of the campaign, Two Republicans in the House, two Republic Democrats in the House, the four of them, stood on a stage in Lyon, France, and announced that Congress would instead do a 16% increase to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, not the 29% cut. And the next reporting period from the Global Fund was that 50 million lives had been saved between 2002 and uh, and 2020, uh, when uh, the fund had been really wow. saved, for, and that was ordinary citizens. Yeah. This was not like big shots, whatever that is. This because people rolled up their sleeves, did their homework, opened yeah. their mouths, you know, and and the like. And so, 
Um, oh, if I could make one other point, and that is, I did this calculation. I spoke on a national conference call a, a couple, some months ago. And I did this calculation that between 2017, when President Trump took office, and last January, about 65% of Congress changed. So it's not like you can have this one victory. Let me go back to 1984 and then take a nap. Mm -hmm. No, it keeps turning over. You have new members of Congress you need to meet with. You need to educate. You need to empower. You need to train. Because if you do a great job and then you stop, you know, in my case, I just mentioned a 65% turnover over a seven-year period. A lot of your 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 ambassadors have left a lot of your you know leaders are gone and you have to you know keep educating and yeah. bring people on board and these so, really are relationships i mean it's like anything in life we 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 have to build relationships and invest time to do it and you know uh this is, this is probably a silly example but we clean our house well it gets dirty again you know we we have to invite in the possibility that our communities and our nation require just as much of our vigilance and time and energy to be yeah. invested in as anything yeah. in life. And that's hard when things are so overwhelming just in most people's everyday lives, but it's so important. And I, you know, you, you were talking, you've talked about a few different things. I, I think people can relate to the idea, it's scary as it may sound, but it's really not, it's fun of say, going to meet with your elected officials and, and sharing what you care about with them and, and having them understand. What are other ways? I know you do a lot of work with the media uh, and, and trying, like, what are the ways we can uh, move beyond the transactional into the transformation? Yeah, so, so I'm going to give you an example back to Congress of something that I consider really important, which is a champion scale. And a lot mm -hmm. of times I'll hear someone say, well, my member of Congress is great on our issues. There's no reason to meet with them because they're actually so, or my member of Congress is such a loser. Mm. There is no reason to meet with them. <laughs> Everyone's busy not meeting with their member of Congress. And I have this champion scale where I encourage people to move those who are opposed to neutral and those who are neutral to supporter. Oh, don't stop there and move those who are supporters up to being advocates and then advocates up to being leaders and then eventually champions. And if I could give two examples, when I'm working with a group who has a member of Congress who's opposed, I urge them to go into a meeting with them and ask these three questions. One, I know you don't support this bill. What would it take to change your mind? Two, could you say more about that? Mm. Three, why do you think that is? And it's like you get deeper and deeper. It's a basically a deep listening exercise. And I urge groups to listen for assignments. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, if they said, well, you know, what would it take to change my mind? If the Chamber of Commerce got on board, I would rethink this. Well, go get the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> listen for assignments. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll give you one other example uh, from opposed. A thing that I uh, urge groups to do is if they're a member of Congress is opposed, go to their website and their news releases and skim through their news releases looking for something they're proud of that you appreciate. Not you, you hate that. They did this thing and you don't, no, no. Something they did that they touted that you're that you really love that they did and write letters to the editor naming them and thanking them for their leadership on x and hoping they can bring that same le leadership to your issue it's just another way uh, of of doing that so let me go to one other example of my members a supporter aren't i done they're co-sponsoring the bill can't i go take an a nap? No, no, no. So I'm going to give you this example, uh, this group from Tri-County, New Jersey. I have this in the book uh, from American Promise. They were um, meeting with the deputy chief of staff for a member of Congress in New Jersey, who is already a co-sponsor 
of this bill on getting money, a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics. And they asked if the member of Congress, we thank them, would speak at a town hall meeting uh, about the bill that they're already a co-sponsor. Now that would require the member to get up to speed on the bill that they're a co-sponsor of, et cetera. So a week later, they hear from the deputy chief of staff, he'll speak at a town hall meeting on Zoom. It was during COVID. And he'll give you 15 minutes privately beforehand. The 15 minutes before the meeting, they thank him for his co-sponsorship. They thank him for the town hall meeting he's about to do. And they ask if he would write an op-ed that they would publish on Constitution Day. And he says yes. So they keep like giving him little opportunities to move from supporter up to being an advocate. And then they, he did the town hall meeting and there were 65 people on board. And then he did the op-ed and it was published on Constitution Day. And so it's an example of taking a member of Congress who's already a co-sponsor and helping them move up the champion scale from supporter, in this case, up to advocate, advocating for the bill they already support. It's mm, beautiful. Yeah. And powerful. Yeah. Uh, t tell us a little bit more about um, how people can influence and in, in you know public opinion and policy through the media, and what do you, what, what right. kind of work you're doing. Well, I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities. I mean, it all starts with being able to speak clearly, being able to you know we'd have uh, laser talks, these little two hundred mm -hmm. word or shorter laser talks, so that you can be conversant on the issue, so you have something to say, essentially. And so that's really important. But it might be in a letter to the editor. I'm going to tell you a quick story in a moment where you look in the paper and you're looking for an article or an editorial that's an opening to talk about your issue. Well, the, the, the thing is, that I just want to, it's almost a digression, but I have been using a modified letters to the editor format that I teach people to do for reclaiming our democracy for the new edition of the book. And what that is, is I look for articles or columns or radio interviews or whatever it is that are an opening to the ideas in the book. And then instead of writing the editor, instead of writing a letter to the editor, I write an email to the columnist or the reporter or the producer of the radio show kind of thing. I, maybe I should be ashamed of this. I've written more than 350 journalists in all of 2023. Wow. And 107 have written back asking for an advanced copy of the book. That's great. And it's just been like amazing uh, kind That's of thing. Beautiful. And um, who knows? Uh, That's great. Well, the book, yeah. it's an, such an important book. And it's, and it's obviously, it's about... Uh, changing the world for the better so it's hardly yeah. selfish but well, when um, the first edition came out in 94 i don't think i would find that many articles and columns right. on oh my god what are we going to do about democracy but right. today right it's right. kind of everywhere yeah. and that's kind of, so that's kind of how you work with people is you know look for these opportunities uh you know as you said radio tv could be yeah. a, an article in the paper to respond to and bring what you're working on and what you care about to them, whether it's uh, yeah. in a newspaper, uh, getting a letter to the editor published, or maybe yes. swaying the editors of the paper to cover it and write an yes. editorial on it. Yes. Uh, or it could be a columnist, like reaching out directly yes. to a columnist or a well, radio let, host. Let me interrupt. If I talk to you, it's you and me, not this podcast, but us talking, that's great. It's important. But if I write a letter to the editor, depending on the size of the paper, it might be 100 people or 1,000 people or 100,000 Mm -hmm. who read the ideas. And not only that, then I can take my letter to the editor and send it to Washington, call the aide on the phone. And did you see the letter I sent you? So then they're seeing, oh, these guys are not just talking to me, the congressperson and the aide. They're talking to the whole community about this issue. Right. We, need to, we need to pay a little more attention because they're not the only ones who know about it. It's everyone who read about 
the issue in their letter to the editor. Right, so, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. I want to, uh, I want to, there was a, a 2012 New York Times column that was titled, uh, There's a Specific Kind of Joy We've Been Missing. And author and professor Adam Grant uh, talked in it about collective effervescence. Which I love the, that phrase. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, the, it, it makes you happy saying the word. <laughs> Uh, which is the sense of energy and harmony people feel when they come together in a group around a shared purpose. And Grant was talking about the joy of returning to a rock concert post-COVID. Uh, yep. And in Reclaiming Our Democracy, it describes how deeper forms of activism can also generate collective effervescence amongst people. So can you give us any examples of that? That's such a beautiful concept. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can think of... of um... Taylor Swift concerts and <laughs> collective effervescence. I mean, the, the bottom line is there's just this joy of, you know, for me to go from, I don't make a difference, the world's screwed and there's nothing I can do about it to like going with the five of us in to meet with our member of Congress and them saying, yeah, that's something I can get behind. Uh, I'm glad you brought that to me. You know, this team of the four of us or the six of us or whatever it is, all of a sudden that you can't make a difference, you can't fight City Hall is you are making a difference and you are fighting City Hall and not with a fight fight, but, you know, you're speaking up and making things happen. And so I think it's just uh, it's one of the phenomenal byproducts of transformational advocacy. Mm. I mean, you uh, I'm going to. Actually, this was in the uh, older edition. I'm going to grab it if I can. I'm going to read uh, one of my okay. early. Hold episodes. up the. For, can you hold up the, oh, in, what, the so video so we yeah. can see it? Beautiful cover. Claiming our democracy. Great. Notice the missing piece in this puzzle. That's us, actually. Yeah, that's good. Good, good, good. <laughs> yes. Love so um, I, I'm going to see if I, I should have. Uh, actually found it quickly, but I'm going to read this thing. Uh, let me set it up. And basically, um, uh, I'm working on an event. It's a long time ago. And um, uh, and uh, I'm meeting with, it's a big event in Los Angeles. And here's the piece I'm looking for. And, um, and I'm meeting with a reporter for the LA Times. And I told her that, well, we were trying to get editorials from TV. Back then, TV stations did editorials and from newspapers. And she said, a little nervous, uh, did you call the LA Times? I said, yeah, we did. They wouldn't return our calls. And she said, oh, who did you call? And I told her. And she said, don't call him. Call, and she names the, uh, the only woman on the editorial board at that time. This is in the 80s. And so I call her from a payphone at a junior high school in Hollywood, California, where I'm a substitute teacher. Mm. Um, and she says, I'm talking to the editorial writer. You remember payphones? And she says, well, we, we don't. This was a World Food Day forum that we were organized. Well, we don't do editorials on days, Labor Day, World Food Day. Why don't we pick an issue and do one? And I promised to send her materials. And uh, she, uh, I said, we hung up. I closed my date book and grade book and I went back to my classroom as a substitute teacher. And um, this is what I want to read. Um, uh, that telephone call and the editorial that followed altered my sense of myself and what was possible. It was normal for me to distribute a hundred photocopies of an action sheet or an important article. But when that first editorial appeared, I remembered thinking, not only has the Los Angeles Times written this editorial, but they've made one million copies of it and they've delivered it for us too. How marvelous. My early morning dash to the front yard to pick up the Los Angeles Times was my run to democracy. I realized that I had the right job to make a difference, substitute teacher. I realized that I had the right training to make a difference. Well, I was trained as a musician. 
I realized that I had the right bank account to make a difference, nearly zero. I realized that making a difference wasn't a function of any of these. It was a function of commitment and persistence. Wow. And that was um, uh, collective effervescence uh, wow. in terms of, you know, I was doing all this work with many others. I was certainly not alone. Uh, and and just uh, the joy was beyond expression in terms of, uh, of that. It, it really is. There's, n there's no other kind of high that I've ever experienced than when you're with people who care about something you care about that's for the collective good or, you know, all kinds of good to go and do this work together and see yeah. the the victories and to also be be a, be kind of commiserate in the challenges and yeah. just yeah. all of it is such a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful way of life and i've loved watching you know the activists that we've trained in the peace alliance you know i've loved 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 my own awakenings and i've loved witnessing their awakenings right. it's like yeah. it's profound and powerful and to see yeah. these relationships built as you said like Sometimes it's with people like elected officials that say it's a, you know, one of our activists might be very liberal and they have a very conservative member of Congress. I remember one woman in particular in Florida who he, her elected official was ranked like the most like conservative member of Congress by whatever standards uh, right. that people were ranking them by. And, and she's just like, this isn't going to work. This is, there's just, I don't know what you crazy, you, you know, you people are yeah. kind of crazy thinking we're yeah. going to like move this person. Like, okay, okay. Her, her daughter was an intern with us. So she wanted to, to give it a try. And she, she had the first meeting. She got the first meeting with, with that official in their district and, and they were friendly. And we, we worked a lot with our elected officials. And maybe you, you want to say something about this in a second about, how to befriend them and really show them respect and not go in with our guns loaded of our anger and, yes. and to really be present yes. with them. And she built this beautiful relationship with him over these things. As you said, tiny steps, it was tiny. And he ended up being the first uh, Republican co-sponsor of this bill. Of the, it happened to be the Youth Promise Act and got other colleagues on board and, and really was able to move it forward because he started to, she made it practical for him and she brought it home for him. And it, I mean, that was just watching that is one example yeah. of just how beautiful yeah. and powerful it was. Yes, Mark Reynolds from Citizens Climate Lobby likes to say, we're betting the farm on relationships. Mm. Now go get a relationship with your member of Congress. Right. And, and uh, right. uh, yeah, and, and that's not a one shot deal. Right. The relationship is well we met we're never going back again no that's not a relationship so yeah and it can be challenging for people you know if you deeply disagree with a say a member of congress on on a number of issues to to step yeah. out of that and to yeah. create that relationship and that you know that can take a lot of work yeah. and training too yeah. it's powerful if i can tell this story i might urge people to go google marshall saunders first congressional meeting or first meeting with a member of Congress. This is like uh, this, like, it's just amazingly funny and poignant and, and whatever. This is the founder of Citizen Climate Lobby telling a thousand vol CCL volunteers about his first ever um, meeting with a results, with a member of Congress while with results. Uh, and he was telling them this in 19... 2015, but his first mm -hmm. meeting was in the 90s. And he says, we go into this meeting and uh, I'm sitting right across from the member of Congress and there's no table in between to protect me. And uh, I don't know if he's looking at me, but I, I, I noticed that my legs are crossed at the ankles. And I thought, that looks goofy. And I crossed him at the knees and I said, that looks laid back. And he <laughs> And I put him flat on the floor. That's better. The meeting's going on. And the guy is freaking <laughs> out about how nervous he was, mm -hmm. you know, and he gets to this point where he says, oh, I think I'm next. I'm, I'm going to go through my talk one more time before they get mm -hmm. to me. And he said, then I realize that's when I realized I couldn't remember what my talk was about. Oh, and I said, so Lord, funny. if you'll give me the first two <laughs> words, I'll take it in the the Lord did not respond. It's a very funny, but when people see it and know that this guy, right. Marshall Saunders, was so nervous, right. 
at his first ever meeting and went on to found an organization that has more than a thousand meetings every year, it kind of gives you a little hope that you can do it uh, and that you don't have to, um, yeah. That's beautiful. That's yeah. beautiful. Well, we're, we are wrapping up our time now, but I want to, um, I want uh, for, for people who are listening to this and really like what they're hearing and they want to get involved, um, how can they, for example, get a copy of the new book? Um, right. Is there a way so they could if, maybe if host they just, a book talk? Oh, great. If they go to uh, reclaimingourdemocracy.com, that will point them to the newest edition and there are links to indie books and Amazon and other kinds of places. So reclaimingourdemocracy.com will get them. Uh, yeah. And, and if you're interested in talking to me about hosting a Zoom book talk, for example, um, just email me at sam at civiccourage.org, sam at civiccourage.org. And tell me what you have in mind, and we'll see what we could could work out. Yeah, it's great. um, That's great. yeah. And how if people want to get involved um, in groups that promote trans, excuse me, transformational advocacy, yeah. like how do they? Because not all do. How, how yeah. Do they? Yeah. Well, you can go to civiccourage.org, my website, and you can link that way. If I could just say. There are three things that I think you need to look for in an advocacy organization mm -hmm. around transformational advocacy. One is enrollment and community building. They're constantly bringing new people in, forming them into chapters. So it's because it's kind of lonely alone uh, and and have an all of organization webinar each month, not just the leaders, but all the participants kind of thing. That's number one, enrollment and community building. Number two, training for effectiveness. They're training on how do you meet a member of Congress? How do you learn the laser talk? How do you get a letter to the editor? That's number two. Number three, they're also engaged in helping people move out of their comfort zone. I love the drawing with the little circle, your comfort zone, and the much lar larger circle where the magic happens. They're, so they're very committed to helping people have breakthroughs by moving out of their comfort zone over to where the magic happens. So, but if you go to civiccourage.org, uh, the website, um, there'll be ways to let me know what you have in mind. That's great. You could also do it from reclaimingourdemocracy.com. There's a sign up sheet there, which will allow you to tell me what kind of issue you're looking at. That's great. And if anybody's interested in uh, even like you talked about laser talks and these various training tools, we at the Peace Alliance, peacealliance.org, we have them, you know, some of these on the website, you can look and just, you know, right. explore it. But I, I haven't gotten that far in the rewrite, but I know a lot of that's in the book too. Oh, yeah, there's so. a very good kind of a handbook, activist handbook at the end of the book. Okay. It's, the beginning is mostly stories and people making a difference and the end is the how to. Good, 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 good. Well, Sam, thank you so much. I have learned so much from you over the years and I always enjoy your your wisdom, your humor, your your bright spirit. Uh, we, at the Peace Alliance, we've been just blessed by, you know, it's like we keep, ampl we all keep amplifying each other, but thank you for for yeah. showing us so many beautiful paths forward. And, and um, this book, I hope will I hope it will help people to even more broadly, I think we should all let people know about this book because what I hope it can do is to awaken a new spirit in our citizenry and in the people doing advocacy work. There's, I, I'm not saying there's not a lot of great work happening. There is even beyond mm -hmm. your model, but yep. it would be great for, for uh, organizing movements to really start to look at how do we bring a wider pool of people into this movement and get them on the ground instead of just sending out these emails saying, sign the petition. Fine, good, sign a petition. It, you know, it does get a message to a member of Congress. As you've said in the book, that has limited effectiveness. But you know, how can we organize people to actually learn these skills and get yeah. involved and, and, and live a, a happy life knowing that we're contributing? 
So thank you for all of that. And I hope folks will check out the book. You want to hold, can you, because we're on video too, if you don't mind holding sure. that book okay. up. Okay, and thank you to everyone who's listening and everyone who's uh, watching and, you know, just folks in the Peace Alliance for your great work over the years. Uh, just uh, <laughs> so grateful for, uh, yeah, people that get involved mm -hmm. rather than sit on the sidelines. Yeah. As Buck, uh, as um, uh, Rusty Schweikert, astronaut, said, we aren't passengers on Spaceship Earth. We're the crew. And so let's, let's do crew. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Sam. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And um, keep, keep checking things out. And we'll, we'll keep putting good content on this platform.